Welcome, Dr. Gerilyn Dodds, and welcome, Guillaume. Hola, muy buenas noches a todas y todos. Hello and good evening. My name is Guillaume Keynes. I am the director of the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, and I am thrilled to welcome you to Las Tertulias de Arte Hispano, or Hispanic Art Gathering. Thank you once again to our members who have joined us monthly for over a year, and welcome to all those who are tuning in for the first time. We continue these conversations on the first Tuesday of each month at 6 p.m. Uh, New York Times. If you are not a member yet, please do consider joining by going on our, to our website, hispanicsociety.org, and search for membership under support. Today, I have the great pleasure of welcoming Geraldine Dodds, Harlequin Ader Diamond Chair in the History of Art at Sarah Lawrence College. Professor Dodd's scholarly work has centered on issues and transculturation and how groups from identities through art and architecture, in particular in the medieval Iberia Peninsula. Among her publications are Arts of Intimacy, Christians, Jews and Muslims in the Making of Castilian Culture, co-authored with Professor Mara Menosal and Abigail Kastner, Balbail, sorry, Architecture and Ideology on, of Early Medieval Spain, and New York Masraid, the Mosque of New York City. She was editor of the catalog and Al-Andalus, the Arts of Islamic Spain at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and served as co-curator of the exhibition of the same name, which took place at the Alhambra in Granada and at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. She was co-editor and curatorial consultant of the Arts of Medieval Spain um, and co-editor and consulting curator for Convivencia, the Arts of Jews, Christian and Muslims in Medieval Iberia, uh, and with Edward Sullivan, co-editor and curator for Crowning Glory, Images of the Virgin in the Arts of Portugal at the Newark Museum. Uh, Geraldine Dodds has written and directed films in conjunction with museum exhibitions, uh, An Imaginary East, New York Masjid, uh, and for wider audiences, Hearts and Stones, The Bridge at Mostar. Professor Dodds was the recipient of the Cruz de la Orden de Merito Civil from the government of Spain in 2018. So we're very, very lucky and honored to have uh, Geraldine Dodds with us tonight. After Professor Dodds' presentation, we will have a brief conversation and invite you to join us afterward by submitting your questions in the comment section. You may submit your questions and comment at any points during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine, and please feel free to begin. Thank you so much for your kind words. It's indeed a great honor to be presenting this tertulia together with the Rector Keynes. It's indeed an exciting moment for the Hispanic Society and a good time to recall a great masterpiece in the collection. Now, I'm going to draw on the work of many scholars here, but I wish to acknowledge in particular Constantio del Alamo, curator emeritus, whose invaluable entry on this amazing work guided me. So the Umayyads were the most powerful Islamic rule on the Iberian Peninsula from the 8th century to the 11th century. Islamic Spain, called Al-Andalus, had its capital in the city of Cordoba at the center of which was the brilliant great mosque with its classical orders and open prayer hall. And just outside of town, the palace city of Medina al-Zahra projected the height of Umayyad splendor in the 10th century. Here could be found the greatest artists of the realm, among whom was an artist named Pilaf, who inscribed his signature on a pyxis, this cylindrical ivory box, a masterwork of the collection of the Hispanic Society. Now, the artists of such works were highly esteemed, and Calaf served the inner sanctum of the court of the Umayyads, the most important Muslim rulers in the history of Al-Andalus. We might expect, then, from this highly literate Umayyad court, the inscription is in the form of a poem. Let me read it to you. The site I offer is the fairest of sights, the still firm breast of a lovely young woman. Beauty has bestowed upon me a robe clad with jewels, 
so that I am a vessel for musk and camphor and ambergris. Now the poem suggests all kinds of ideas that were beloved of the Orientalist scholars of the 19th century, who believed that Islamic cultures were decadent, caught in harems that were all about sex and sensuality, when it was in fact about the repression of the 19th century scholars, but we're not gonna go there right now. Instead, this poem is the metaphorical language of poetry. Sensuality, of course, but far more. The lid, it says, is in the shape of a breast. Now this was a metaphor that had been established hundreds of years before in pre-Islamic times in a manuscript we know to have been in the Umayyad court in Cordoba. It read this, the tender breast is like the lid of an ivory, which is protected from those who would touch it. So this is about something protected, something inaccessible, as the object would also be exclusive only for the hands of the elite person for whom it was made. And its knob is in the form of a pomegranate, a fruit that was an emblem of fertility. Now the robe clad with jewels of the poem is a celebration of the fine quality of the carving. It's flawlessly undercut. If you can see it here, it's, the, it's, cut, it's undercut here so that these leaves seem to flutter above the, so, above the surface of the, of the box. It's beautifully consistent and measured. And the design is called a taurique, sometimes called arabesque ornament. And what it is, it's a vine scroll that seems to have no beginning or no end. And if you've ever tried to untangle uh, a grapevine, right, with all of its little tendrils, you have some idea of the derivation of this form. You can't tell really how it begins and how it ends. Scholars in the beginning of the 20th century tended to think of this as feminine. And they did not seem feminine in those days as an adjective that, annotated some, that denotated something serious. Instead, they represented Islamic Spain as a kind of decadent culture, and they saw this as meaningless ornament. However, this never-ending form is something like a structural expression of a complex idea. You cannot see the beginning or end of the vine. It is about something that is eternal or never-ending. Now, the arabesque or atarike reminds us that early Islam is part of the late antique world, part of the symbolic language of the late antique world as well. You know, people like to think of Islam as something that's Eastern and Roman world is something that's Western, but it's not the case at all. Islam grew from the late antique world in the same way that early Christian culture did. So the arabesque or atarike reminds us that the Umayyads were heirs to the Roman world and use its forms just as Christians did in art and architecture. For instance, here you see the Arapakis of Augustus, and here he uses a vine scroll as a way of telling you that he's going to bring um, abundance and fertility to the Roman Empire. So abundance and fertility are political ideas. For Augustus, it was a political promise that he would bring these to his realm. And for the Umayyads of Cordoba, they were promising this as well, and they were promising it eternally. A specific kind of vine scrolling fact called the karma is associated with an imperial Umayyad style in Damascus, and those were the Damascus forebearers of the Umayyads of Spain. Now, another box with this never-ending vine made by the same artist, Kalaf, was made for Princess Walada, one of the daughters of Abdurrahman III, the greatest of the Umayyad caliphs. Its inscription tells us this and also where it was made, the palace city of Medina al-Zahra that we saw earlier. The women to whom these were given were often mothers to the heirs of the throne. For instance, this is a pyxis made for Sub, the favored concubine of the caliph al-Hakam II. She's called Umwalad, mother of the sun in the inscription, an honorific because she bore him an heir, and by bear bearing an heir, she contributed to the strength and abundance of the caliphate. Now, don't forget Sue, because we're gonna to return to her later on. Now, this one has not just the vine scroll, but it has little peacocks and little antelopes, little animals. 
We know that images of living beings are not permitted in religious contexts in Islamic cultures, not in mosques or Qurans, but they appear in plenty in secular contexts. However, the, this decoration in particular also reminds us that there's a sophisticated attention to complex abstract expression as well, in which non-figural decoration, or as in this case, limited figural decoration, were far more than just ornament. They had multiple elusive meanings. And because in early Islamic cultures there was a real exploration of abstract forms of art, as well as figural forms of art, these were two different ways that artistic expression was developed, um, there were multiple elusive meanings. So here the atawrike can mean abundance, but the birds and deer hidden in the foliage of the Pyxis can as well. Now here I'm showing you decoration of the palace of Mishata. It's very near, but this decoration is very close to where Guillaume is right now, because it's in the Pergamon Museum. And here in this decoration, here in this decoration we find the same combination of the never-ending vine and little animals inserted in the inside. So these are the castles of the forebearers of the Umayyads of Spain. So now we're into the political realm as well. These motifs can also commemorate abundance and fertility with which these women help to assure the strength of the caliphate in Spain, not just the strength of the old caliphate in Syria, but its continuation in Spain. But this was not something to be advertised. From its poetry, we know it was a gift within the court, not for the public to see. And the things it would contain, musk and camphor and ambergris, were prohibitively expensive. They were from far off places that increased their expense and prestige. They were on the whole sense, S-C-E-N-T-S, they were smells used in the highest echelons of the Umayyad court and used equally by men as by women. Perfumes were part of sophisticated etiquette at court. Um, a guest, especially an honored guest, would be anointed with these perfumes and unguents as they were, and they were also part of medical practices. Muhammad himself was said to have never refused a gift of perfume and he apparently urged his followers to do likewise. So aromatic substances were some of the most precious commodities of trade, and that's what was in this Pyxis. They acquired great prestige from their remote origins and consequently from their high cost. So the first one mentioned in the poem is musk. The musk deer, well, imagine you're in Spain and the musk deer is found in Manchuria, the Himalayas, Siberia, Mongolia, and most of the musk that came to Al-Andalus was apparently produced in Tibet. It was then and is still the most expensive substance derived from an animal. So not surprisingly today, the musk deer is in danger of extinction, both because of the loss of habitat and the demand for lust. Ambergris was a product of the Indian Ocean where it sometimes washed ashore, sometimes in South Arabia. It's a waxy substance that the, that's the result of a pathological infection of the intestinal tract of a sperm whale. So of ambergris, Herman Melville wrote, who would think then that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with a perfume found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? It is extremely rare and was rarer then. Camphor is the dried sap of certain kinds of camphor trees which were once again incredibly remote and expensive. Such luxury and such refinement, because scent was a function of refined life, was a demonstration of political and economic power. And sometimes it takes us a while to wrap our mind around that because, for instance, the medieval Christian monarch of Spain did not find their expression of political and economic power in refinement. They found it in other things, but this is a totally different context. But these objects not only contained material of great extravagance and prestige, but the material in which they were made was linked to politics and power as well. 
During 100 years, the court produced incredible ivory boxes. No tradition of this in Iberia existed before the Umayyads, and after the Umayyads left, it petered out very quickly. We'll talk about a couple of, 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 of exclusions to that rule. Over 30 boxes survive, and that in itself is quite extraordinary. Ivory was a highly precious material from Sub-Saharan Africa. The hardest of all organic materials, it's still very easy to work. It's luminous, at times translucent, it's tactile, and it's organic. Sometimes you can feel warm to the touch. We forget that it's organic. We forget that it's part of an animal. A pixis is actually a wasteful use of ivory. So you could take slices off this tusk and make them plaques on the outside of a rectangular box, but a pixis uses the circumference of, of, of the tusk and just empties out the ivory on the inside. So this is a kind of conspicuous consumption. Somehow the Umayyads were showing that they had ivory to burn, which they didn't. It was incredibly expensive, but it was a way of showing, um, well, let's see what it was a way of showing. It was a way of showing the fact that they had control of the trans-Saharan trade in ivory and gold. Now, we should, by rights, be talking about gold at the same time, and, and the conservator at the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, Miriam Rosser Owen, um, has linked the two in a really interesting way um, because they're both being brought, brought north. But of course, the gold has all been melted down or, or is maybe left to us in a, few, in, in a few coins, but it's the ivory that survives us. So, so the ivory trade came up here. And what are the Omeyads telling us? Well, they're telling us in part that, um, that they control, they dominate, the North African ivory trade. They control it in defiance to this other caliphate. So for whom did they need to flex their muscles? People often suppose that it was the Christians. And they suppose that because of maps like this one. Look, here's the kingdom of Asturias, Leon, Castile, Navarre, Aragon, and Catalonia. But for some reason, they're all one color. They're all one color because the map makers supposed that the most important juxtaposition on the Iberian Peninsula was between Muslims and Christians, when that wasn't the case at all. Um, there are many alliances across that border and many wars between Christian rulers. So these maps are in a way quite misleading. And instead it's better to think of it this way. Um, better to look at things like this because this wasn't the main problem of the Umayyads of the Iberian Peninsula. Their main problem was the Fatimid Caliphate or the many other groups growing up here. Their main problem was asserting their rights as the new Umayyad Caliphate of the Iberian Peninsula. So each ivory object that they made during this period asserted their control and authority over the gold and ivory trade to sub-Saharan Africa. What they wanted to establish was both their control of the trade, trade route, which the Fatimid dynasty challenged, and also their right to it. Ivory boxes fa fashioned at Medina al-Zahra were given to many different peoples. They were given as diplomatic gifts they reminded other rulers of the Umayyads' control over these trade routes and also of their superior cultural attainment, their capacity to employ artists like Kalaf. Superior culture was a sign of superior claim to rule, another thing that's very, that was new on the Iberian Peninsula to the Umayyads. And they asserted this with other arts as well, like textiles, silks which had not been previously made on the Iberian Peninsula or silks brought from the East. Sometimes these include images of authority like a falconer, the most aristocratic form of hunting. Hunting is symbolic of authority over the land. And you can imagine if you hunt with a falcon, how much authority do you have to have? Because your falcon can, can 
can fly miles. And in order to have the right to hunt in those lands, you have to be a powerful person as well. So the falconer was one of the great, um, was one of the great metaphors for Umayyads and one of the great symbols of authority over the land. And when they were wrought in an in a ivory or a fabulous silk, you know, even more they were showing the kind of re refinement which was a sign of rule. Others show other kinds of hunting as kinds of, of mastery and dominion or metaphors for other battles as this image of a lion hunter. Okay, but here's something that we have to think about a little more carefully. This is one arm of a cross. This is the cross partially reconstructed in plexiglass. A cross in the church of San Millán de la Cogoya in the, north of, in the north of Spain. But what is this cross of ivory in the style of Medina Azahra doing here? And how does this elite courtly art come to the kingdom of Navarre? So it was way up here in the kingdom of Navarre. It comes here because the, it comes here because Queen Toda, who probably gave this cross to the Church of San Millan, was the great aunt of the Umayyad Caliph Abd al-Rahman III, probably who gave one of those boxes to his daughter. How was she the great aunt? She was a she was the great aunt, and I don't expect you to read this. There will be no there will be there will be no quiz at the end of this presentation, but she was the aunt because the Umayyads regularly took princesses from the Christian rules of Spain and in particular the Kingdom of Navarre as concubines, and they had their heirs with them. They bore their heirs with them, and so many of the rulers of um, Many of, the, many of the rulers of, of, of Umayyad Spain had blonde hair, even, even, even red hair, and they were intermarried. So Queen Toda made treaties with her nephew, Abd al-Rahman III, exchanged diplomatic gifts with him. And so in exhibiting this ivory cross in a church, she was showing her Christian rivals that she had this powerful alliance. Religion was not the main issue in this complex political situation. Which brings us back to Soup, whose Pixis this is. You'll remember that she bore the heir of the great Caliph Al-Hakam II, who called her Saida al-Kubra, or Great Lady. And of course, there was the inscription in which she's called Mother of the Sun. The state of the realm depended on fertility and also on her great diplomatic skills but she was born a Christian noble in Navarre. And when she went to become a concubine and then an honored mother of the heir in, um, in, in the court of, court of, of Medina al-Zahra, she also became the most powerful woman in the realm, essentially reigning on behalf of her son when his father died. Things are always more complex than we imagine them to be. After the fall of the Caliphate, Al-Andalus would be ruled by a number of small kingdoms. So the Caliphate would have been around up to here before, but now you see there's a kingdom of Barajos, Toledo, Seville, Cordoba, Granada, Murcia, Denia, Valencia. And they had kind of kaleidoscopic political relations with the Christian kingdoms in the north. So that, um, so that the king of Castile might have a feudal client in the kingdom of Toledo, and he would join with them to fight against his brother, who he kind of hated, in the kingdom of Galicia. These kingdoms became allies and feudal clients of the increasingly powerful Christian kingdoms and had to pay them tribute money and sometimes tribute objects and fight alongside them in their wars. So, these kingdoms, the, those kingdoms ruled by Muslims, had very limited access to ivory. They no longer controlled that ivory trade, obviously. And they also didn't have the same fine level of craftsmanship as you can see in this uh, dunit box. When they could get ivory, they mostly used it to try to mimic the power of the Umayyads with images of the hunt and domination. And these caskets often fell into the hands of Christian rulers. 
people used to it to, to think that that was as part of the booty of war, but that's not actually what was happening. They were coming mostly in trade and as tribute from their feudal clients who had to pay them tribute. And this is how the casket made for the Dunid ruler in Toledo fell into the monastery of Santo Domingo de Silos near Burgos. It was probably donated by a pious ruler or lord who had received it as tribute. And here, the monastery uses the casket to house the most sacred of its holy relics. It did not matter that the casket was made by Muslims or that it had an Arabic inscription. The box was re recognized to be a receptacle of the most precious materials and artistry. And the fact that it was made by Muslims only verified its elite quality. And they had wished to harness the political authority and power inherent in an ivory box of Umayyad manufacture. They understood its meanings. So the monks of Santo Domingo de Silos repaired it. There was obviously one, one, one plaque that was missing. So they repaired it with an enamel image of Saint Dominic, Santo Domingo, so that all those meanings of power and authority conceived in Al-Andalus could serve the cult of Santo Domingo as well. So the Hispanic Society Pixis is considered perhaps the finest object of this extraordinary and short moment of ivory manufacture in Al-Andalus. We are so amazingly privileged to have it in New York City. And now as we look at it one last time, we can begin to understand how many layers of meaning it holds. And we can also understand the more complex relations of Christians and Muslims in Al-Andalus through it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jereen, for this fascinating and stimulating um, lecture, and which reminds us how great our collection of Islamic art is at the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. And uh, so we're so grateful. Uh, I have many questions, but perhaps I should start with this one. We have spoken in the past of Mudejar or Hispano-Moresque arts, but no, I, I know that the terminology has changed. Can you tell us something about the, the critics of those terms that are based on religion and what are the, the, the right terms we should be using today? Well, yes, I can't, I can't be the, the, I can't be the ultimate authority, but I could say this. We've come to realize in the same way that we've stopped using the map that I showed in which the main differentiation is between Christians and Muslims, we've come to realize that perhaps terms that concentrate on religion are not the most useful ones for understanding what was happening. So that, for instance, mudehar is a term that suggests um, a Muslim who is submitted, and it was used to talk about the arts of uh, arts in in a kind of kind of Islamic tradition that continued and developed as Christians developed more and more um, power on the Iberian Peninsula. But then people started looking into it and they realized that Mudejar was probably a term that some Muslims used to others in which they, 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 were, they were calling them domesticated as if they were the domesticated animals of, 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 of Christians. And then, and then we saw that if we assumed that those arts were just the product of Muslims, we were not really opening up to the really amazing fact that um, these arts were becoming part of everybody's uh, identity on the Iberian Peninsula. Lots of Christians were, were working in this. I mean, actually, the, the work, the people doing the work, there were multi-confessional work groups. It wasn't all Muslims working or, or all Christians, but more than that, um, people in the church and rulers were seeing this as part of a, of a shared heritage. They weren't seeing it as Muslim or Christian. So, um, so, we, so now we try to be as, you know, as, as, as specific as possible uh, when, when we talk, but, we, but we're trying not to use a special word for, um, for, for, for arts that show the impact of Islamic tradition um, but rather to understand um, what it means that that taste is being adopted by certain groups. So it, it kind of opens things up. So, so I, I don't have a ruler with which I hit the, the hands of students who 
you know, they're all good. I just say, look how much more is possible, you know, if you use that. And the same with Hispano Moresque, which, um, which suggests that, um, that it, you know, for instance, and I know, and I certainly know that that Margaret McKay Quandris is a wonderful scholar of um, of lusterware and and cer ceramics knows knows that, knows this as well that 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 um, it tends to make you sort of just focus in is this a Christian is this a Muslim what's Christian about this and, and of course it has nothing to do with religion it has to do with traditions that are shared and how much more exciting is it to talk about that right right. Well, thank you. And, and tell us, um, what are some of the different ways in which these uh, caskets were preserved? Uh, I think there are uh, some 30 ivory caskets that survive from a period of only half a century. So why and how have they been preserved over a thousand of years? And, and when so many opulent courts art from this period have been lost. So can you explain that to us? It's, it's really true. It's, it's amazing. And um... I guess we touched at that a tiny bit, um, a, a tiny bit at the end. So what happens is that um, at the fall of the the Umayyads, they, they're still considered to be very precious, as we saw at Santo Domingo de Silos, and um, they they fall into the hands of rulers and lords who give them to monasteries, where they're considered so precious they become the receptacles for relics, and so they're preserved in churches and in monasteries and the same with uh, the textiles well, many of the textiles that we have that survived from that time were actually used to wrap relics and it's wonderful because it shows you how the um the meanings and quality of those works um were appreciated and understood in a way that surpassed religious difference right this was the most precious kind of textile or the most precious kind of box that you, you could you could have. Now, some, some of them also pass, there's this wonderful box, it's not an ivory box, but it's a silver and yellow box, box in Girona, and it's in the cathedral treasury of Girona, and scholars used to say, well, this is a, this is a, a spoil of war, and it shows Christians uh, defeating Muslims, but in fact, but in fact, it was a, it was given as payment to a ca I think a Catalan I could be wrong but I think it was given in payment to a Catalan lord who brought his who was a mercenary for one of the Islamic taifa kingdoms who was fighting against an Islamic taifa kingdom you couldn't get more complicated than that and then he gave it to the church so even if it later on somebody tried to represent it as a Christian versus Muslim thing in fact it was from the most complicated of intimate intertwinings of political groups. Okay, well, thank you. And, and another question, which is a mystery to me, why does uh, this ivory art nearly disappear on the Iberian Peninsula after the 11th century? Is there a reason for that? Do you know? Uh, because they, um, so remember I showed that, that uh, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I showed the, the, the map of the right. ivory trade so um, when the Umayyad Caliphate breaks down into these little different groups, none of them have the power to dominate that ivory trade. So the ivory trade get, gets taken up by the North African, um, the different North African groups. And, it, it, and I, 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 should, I should say that along with the ivory trade was a gold trade. So it was it was really important and it was actually politically important because supposedly only a caliph can print did i say print uh you don't print coins what do you do you uh, <laughs> you don't carve them either i don't know what you do with that but well you we, we, we see what you we see what you mean okay they can only mint gold can only mint gold coins so there was just a lot of authority associated with this so when, when it broke down to these different groups who were actually very dependent on their Christian allies, they totally lost, they lost, they, they lost control of that right. ivory. So, so it's not only true for uh, ivory, it's only true for gold, gold. medals and, yeah. and all the thing. Okay, right. I get you. Thank you. And, and just a very basic question, I'm sorry. Um, what about the name Pixies? How did the 
pixies get its name? I mean, is there an history of this form or an, of the name? I mean, I, what does that mean? So, um, so I've forgotten. So I, I actually, I, when I, when I did this, I, I, I actually, I actually went to look it up. I forget, I forget what the term comes from, but it actually, it actually goes back to, um, to Greek times. Ooh, ooh, mm -hmm. Can I show you? I have a slide. May I show it? Sure. I, I, until the last minute, I thought I might, yeah, I could do it if I actually knew what I was doing here. There. <laughs> Can you see that? No. Not yet. Oh, just not just share your screen. I have to share my screen. Just a second. Okay. I have to find you and share my screen. There it is. Okay. There. Oh, yes. We is, see you. Can you see that even though I, it's yeah. strange? Okay. The, um, so, if you can put it full screen, you know. Yeah, let me try. A slideshow. Yeah, you're really, you're, oh, you know what? I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to put it full screen and then I'll do that. Showing that I'm a Luddite. Okay. Okay. I actually. You're so vase. What? We saw yes. a vase. Yes, you saw you saw a vase, and you also saw that. Let me just let me let me do this in a better way. I'm not going to do it full screen because that's fine. I'm having I'm having troubles of high technical incompetence. There, can you see enough of it? Yeah. Oh, okay. If you can scroll down a bit, yeah. No, it's good. Yes. No, that's this is, oh, I see. Right. So. Um, this is a this is a this is a Greek pixis, mm -hmm. um, a, a late archaic early classical pixis, and it was a kind of gift that you gave to a woman at her wedding, and she put cosmetics in it, so scents oh, and things. So it's actually a, a form that was traditional for this, that carried through classical times, through Roman times, and um, carried through to to Umayyad times. So the association of this form with scents and cosmetics and unguents goes all the way through but i'm sorry to have not remembered how the derivation of the term that's fine we look at that on the internet and, uh, yeah, exactly. and we, we all learn something it's a <laughs> work in progress well thank you so much jared and christina do we have any question from our um audience Yes, we do. And thank you again for such a wonderful talk. Uh, we have several questions. The first one is from Professor Edward Sullivan. Uh, is there any evidence for a relationship between Islamic ivory artisans and those in Western Africa, as in, for instance, Benin? Uh, this is such a smart question, of course, because it comes from Edward Sullivan. <laughs> <laughs> So hi um, Edward. The, the, hi Edward. <laughs> so um, uh, in the period that I'm talking about now, one of the things that would happen it's not a, this is an anecdote rather than an absolute answer. Um, what would happen is that the Umayyads were um, were working with these Berber clients in North Africa to get control of the ivory trade, and they would get the raw ivory. And then they would have them. Um, they would have. They would have their artists in Medina al Zahra work in them, and then they would give them back to them. And it was considered a kind of one-upmanship. You guys give us the ivory, but we're the ones who know how to make these beautiful and refined objects. That makes me doubt if there's a connection in the Umayyad period between the. The, uh, the artists in sub-Saharan Africa and and in the Iberian Peninsula, but I think that's all I could offer in in, in terms of an answer. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> Thank you. And another question is: other than the two works that you showed by Caliph, do we know of any other works by him signed or attributed, and do we have any biographical information concerning him? We don't have biographical information um, concerning him. We don't have any other, we don't have, a, some people attribute um, one or two of the other boxes from the period of Abdul Rahman III to him. But we don't have any biographical, um, biographical information. 
um, uh, he doesn't, he has a, we're not sure from his name um, what his status was exactly. I mean, he probably, he had a high status in court. Of course, this is a court in which he, even if you were a, a slave, you could have a very, you could have an extremely high, 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 high status. And people are actually are having, are sort of working on, on how we would establish, um, you know, what kind of lives they led. There's a, there's a little mistake in the, um, in the epigraphy. Um, and some people suggest that that means that he wasn't literate. I, I, I'd rather think it was a mistake in the epigraphy. So you can tell we're all, we're all, all, all over the place at this, that he had a high, uh, that he had a fairly high status in court is all we might really say. Thank you. And do you know much about the provenance of the Hispanic society Pixis specifically and how it came to the museum? Um, now that's embarrassing because I do not, but I'll tell you the provenance right away. Um, oh, it's probably a Huntington purchase, isn't I'm it? I'm sure it's a Huntington because, and, and you'll have to talk to us about that. It's, um, so Toussaint Joseph Bauer, 1869, John Malcolm. Oh, oh, oh so it's after Huntington because he died in 55. Well, no, 1869. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Excuse yeah. Me. Huntington bought it in 1913 and gave it to the Hispanic Society in 1914. So it went from, um, it looks like a, a, a dealer in 1869 to um, John Malcolm of Polto Lock. That sounds like a, uh, uh, that sounds like a um, Scottish nobleman to Lionel Harris. So that that would be that would that would be that would be the provenance so it came from Huntington and this is a bit of a follow-up question um, from another member but how did an object like this and I think you you touched on this uh, in your talk but how could it have survived the destruction of Medina Alzara by the Abbasids and do you imagine that it escaped by, for example, perhaps being gifted to someone else during the Umayyad Caliphate? Or could we imagine that perhaps it ended up in a church treasury? Well, I, yes, we definitely think that it was in a church treasury. Absolutely. Um, I think that before Medina al-Zahra was actually destroyed, all the objects of great value had already been either looted or taken away. And you remember that there were some, <clears throat> there were some moments after the last, you know, Sub, uh, Sub's son, Hisham, <clears throat> was very, was very weak. Uh, um, the Umayyad Caliphate was ruled by Hajib. And then his, you know, his son started to try to continue things. But things were there was a, there was a period of, of of pretty of chaos, and I think during that late period and during the early period of the breakdown, Cordoba became one of those Taifa kingdoms. So there was a lot of um, ah here's a good here's a, let me let me try to get articulate again. Remember I told you about that silver box that was given as payment to a mercenary. Um, and that ended up in the cathedral treasury in Girona. Well, um, that was from the Taifa period in which, you know, just the very earliest period of that, I think that um, before the destruction of Medina al-Zahra, objects like this could have been used as tribute or to pay mercenaries and things like that. So I think that that's probably one of the ways in which, in which they, they came north. And when they came north, they very, very quickly, um, many of them very quickly ended up in uh, cathedral treasuries. So I imagine that that's how that happened. And those tr cathedral treasuries, some of them were licitly or illicitly selling off 
what they had in the early 19th century. Wonderful, thanks again. And um, one of the final questions we have uh, is actually regarding another Pyxis uh, from the 10th century that is at the Met. And this one actually does not have a lid. Right. And uh, the member is wondering, is there any connection between these two? If you happen to know, or has there been any conjecture about it perhaps being by the same artist? I, I don't think it, I had, I guess I didn't put, I had it at one point in the PowerPoint, but it got too long, so I took it out. I don't think it's by the same artist. There's a different um, quality to the carving. It has some of the same iconography as the Pixis of Soup. It has little birds in it as well as, um, as vines. So I think it's, it's part of the same tradition, but a different artist. It's a great Pixis. And just a final practical question. Do you have any, I'm assuming you don't have any images of the Pyxis next to another object, but approximately what size is this object? And does it compare in size to the other surviving uh, Pyxi that you know of? Yeah, so uh, the, um, <clears throat> They're, they, they, they're pretty consistent. They're pretty consistent in size. They're pretty consistent in size. This one is 16 by 10 centimeters. So 16 centimeters high and 10 centimeters uh, in uh, diameter. Well, that's not small. No. That's a decent size. It's a decent size. It is. Absolutely. But well, then it, makes us, it makes us feel sad for the elephants. Yeah, I want about to say, you know, before we end this uh, fascinating conversation, and, and as much as we admire these incredible objects, we have to acknowledge at uh, disaster. Uh, I mean, you know, it causes to, to, to elephant. And I just wanted to share my, my screen and 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 uh, encourage uh, our um, audience to, to donate to the worldwide uh, life uh, to endangered species because they're fantastic objects it is true but they cost the life of so many incredible creatures and and personally i'm a big fan of elephants so i i have a you know it's a bittersweet feeling and those objects are fantastic and we're so lucky to have them at the hispanic society but ivory trade is a very serious matter and, and we should all stand against that because it it, it again it, it costs the life of so many uh elephants and uh so we have to to save the elephants so so i wanted to, to balance this this talk with this uh appeal to you all to to help the, the this very noble uh, cause. Um, so thank you again, uh, Jerrin, for this fascinating um, presentation and, and, and conversation. And um, well, uh, we will have more of those tertullias <laughs> coming up. And uh, I want to thank you and our members for this wonderful uh, tertullia tonight. We are thrilled our community and supporters continue to stay involved with the museum. And as a reminder, we have two wonderful exhibitions open at the moment that you may visit in the Heights from University to Silver Screen. It is about the movie and the musicals and the plays in the Heights. That, uh, so we're doing an exhibition about that at the Hispanic Society in the East Building Gallery and Latinx Diaspora Stories from Upper Manhattan. It is uh, four murals that we exhibit on the Broadway terrace. So it is open daily from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So come and visit and, and, and bring your friends and, and family. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, Geraldine, again and again for this incredible lecture. And, uh, and I, I'll see you all very soon. And take care. Bye. Bye-bye.